some questions in there, I think, that are warranted over why Justin Trudeau wasn't told, even if the threat was not necessarily all that much of a threat, nevertheless, let the Prime Minister know. Tom Mulcair is standing by. He's going to help me uh, make some sense of this. Good to see you, my friend. Your thoughts on what we're seeing today. Let's start there. Well, uh, I think that in his earlier testimony that he was giving in French, Dominique Leblanc showed an absence of the acute memory we've always known him to have. Uh, he couldn't recall whether CSIS gave him specific information about the rioting. He danced around that question. And what was interesting is in the testimony he just gave, unprompted, in other words, it wasn't in response to a question he had just been asked, he revisited that and said, and by the way, they did not give us information about specific places in writing. So obviously, they're being extra extraordinarily careful. They don't want to, and I think that your, your setup was, was impeccable, Todd. You're, they do not want to be seen in any way to have had enough information with Justin Trudeau for him to be responsible for not doing anything about it. Um, but there's one part of this whole story that is difficult uh, for them to explain. To everything that we could. It's the uh, fact I, that Mr. I Trudeau in 2022 uh, was with President Xi of China, and at that time, he was able to blast President Xi saying, you've been interfering in my elections. So Justin Trudeau clearly had enough information from somebody to say that to the leader of one of the most powerful nations in the world. Yeah, well said. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm also curious what you think we're going to hear from Trudeau, Tom, because that's going to be really interesting. Although, as you know, he no doubt has been, you know, sort of briefed up the wazoo, so to speak, about what to say, what not to say, uh, how to say it. Um, you know, if he gets into some tough answers, how to respond. Some of it might be kind of talking points. Uh, your, your thoughts on what we might hear from Trudeau, what you would like to hear from Trudeau. Trudeau's very good when he's briefed and when he's given exactly his marching orders. He did very well in front of Justice Rulo on the Commission of Inquiry into the, the truckers who had shut down Ottawa, that so-called Freedom Convoy. He did great because he stuck to the script religiously, didn't wander in any way. I have not sensed any great desire on the part of counsel before the, this commission to push hard on the various witnesses, but I think that there are things that only Mr. Trudeau can answer. And if he tries to give the type of answer that Dominic LeBlanc gave this morning, when he said, well, I don't really recall that level of detail from CSIS, then there might be problems for him. He's going to have to be affirmative. And if it's, no, we never discussed that, then he better say, no, we never discussed that. If he starts dancing around it the way LeBlanc did, I think there's going to be a lot of return uh, to some of LeBlanc's earlier testimony during the day, because it was difficult coming from someone who studied at one. Of, he's you know he studied at one of the top law schools in the United States. Uh, he's no slouch. He was the minister of democratic institutions. He's getting briefed by CSIS, but never occurred to him to ask what writing it was. Mm, that that strains credulity somewhat. Yeah, uh, you know, you were a leader of the NDP for a long time. You're no stranger to politics, of course. So uh, let me let me ask you whether you think, you know, and I know that, you know, some are watching this and saying, oh, you know, nothing's going to come out of this. This is all just, you know, a, a dog and pony show. Uh, what's your take? I mean, are we actually going to get any anything? Is there going to be any sort of bombshells here or or not? I think that if there's a contradiction that can be proven in the documents between what is being said by Trudeau and the people around him. I mean, a phalanx of his highest level advisors came in yesterday and tried their best to stick to a script. But again, they were being contradicted by the specific wordings of documents from CSIS. The best of that lot, the best I've seen in my political career, Katie Telford, did, did a masterful job of trying to, you know, chum the waters as much as you could. Oh, look over here, over there, but don't look at this. And, and, and she's excellent at it. She's, well, you know, that, that's what they said, but we don't have a memory of that sort of thing. What they're also have, they're having to be very careful about one thing. What does CSIS have? Do, do they take the trouble of taking a written record? Is the record more conclusive and definitive than that? And does it contain everything that was said during those briefings? If CSIS has that and it contradicts what's being said, then that could be huge trouble for the government. Yeah, you, you've been a politician for, you know, or were for 30 years. I've been a journalist for more than 25. And, and I, I believe the technique you're talking about is sort of fogging, right? So you're there and they're asking you questions and you know that there's a certain, you know, clock that's ticking. And so you can just yeah. kind of, you know, drone on, uh, you know, uh, answer in sort of, you know, long, long form responses um, and, you know, maybe say a little bit, but, but a lot of it is just sort of, uh, you know, talk. At some point, the droning becomes the answer <laughs> that the public is looking for. And again, I, I go back to that meeting with Xi. They're in Bali, Indonesia, November 2022, uh, before all of the details of this thing broke. 
Trudeau had enough information to upgrade with his you know, index under the nose of the president of China. And there was a second meeting where he got it back from the president of China saying, you've got to talk about this stuff. It's got to be in private. You're not allowed to leak it. So the people around Trudeau were proud to say that Trudeau was doing something about it. Is it because they knew at that point that some parts of this was going to come out and Trudeau wanted to show he was on it, that he was doing something. He was standing for uh, democratic principles and in our institutions in Canada. The most damning part of this, and it's yet to be clarified, is whether or not Trudeau knew, did nothing about it because it was going to hurt the Conservatives more than it was going to hurt the Liberals. And that, I think, is the question that Madam Justice Hogue is going to have to get to. And if she's not able through her commission counsel that she has to rely on. She's 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 judging this. She's not supposed to be actively involved, although she can ask questions. So she's got to rely on her counsel to get to the bottom of this by being tough and unrelenting in their questioning of all of the witnesses, including, as we're just seeing now, Dominic LeBlanc is uh, being given a good question, but more importantly, of course, for the average Canadian, it's what happens with Justin Trudeau in the next little while. How much damage do you think this has the potential to do, Tom, or not, to Justin Trudeau? I'll, I'll answer that by rolling back all of the stone walls they tried to put up to stop this inquiry. So when they handed this to a committee of three civil servants who all worked for Trudeau, and then they had that work revised by somebody who just happened to have once headed up the Trudeau Foundation. That was all supposed to settle everything. And then when the public said, you've got to be kidding, he says, well, okay, I'll give it to this very neutral guy, David Johnson. And then all his links to the Trudeau family started coming out, and he had to withdraw. It wasn't credible anymore. So this is the final thing. So is the stone wall, is the reaction, is that face that we saw yesterday of the people around Trudeau, is that going to hold? Is has there been enough? Have there been enough cracks through Dominic Lavalin's testimony today for people to start scratching their heads and saying, okay, some parts of this aren't holding together? And the final act in terms of the key witnesses is going to be Justin Trudeau. And if there is any contradiction or weakness between his testimony and that of the others then all those questions will be right back on the table. One of the other things I've heard, uh, and, and I appreciate you taking an extended time with us today, Tom, because you know your insights are great as always. You know this this notion that, well, you know, in 2019, you know, the idea of, of you know electoral interference and and you know a misinformation was all kind of new, uh, you know, and so the Canadian intelligence agencies were doing their best to keep track of it all, and for us politicians, you know, this was all new territory as well. Um, your take on whether that is sort of a credible argument to put forward. No, it's not, because as early as the election in 2015, and I regret that that's not being looked at, that was the one where I faced Trudeau and Harper, uh, we have been given indications, not from inside the government, but, but from outside, uh, that Russia had been playing a role actively in trolling in that election. Maybe it got refined. You know, this is an understanding for Canadians that the voting process is the key to our democracy, but it's also the soft underbelly of our democracy. It's easy to corrupt. It's easy to attack with the techniques and the technologies that exist today. And you're able to get to people individually. You're able to get to communities. You're able to get especially to diaspora communities, not just one or two. So I'm always careful to say this is not about Chinese Canadians. This is about bad acting by the Chinese Communist Party, the Chinese government. And there's a huge difference between the two. And that's where it gets tricky too, doesn't it? You know, if you start to drill down into individual ridings, like let's say in the greater Toronto area, Tom, or as you know, in the lower or Midland, greater Montreal, or greater Montreal, or in the Vancouver area as well. And, and you know, it starts to become, you know, ethnic communities, uh, Chinese Canadian communities, South Asian communities as well. Again, uh, you know, very challenging to talk about, oh, are those communities being targeted by, you know, let's say China or India or Russia or whatever the case may be? Exactly. And diaspora politics, by the way, is nothing new in a country like Canada that was built by immigration. You know, you can go back uh, to a century ago and you'll find, uh, you know, Irish ward healers trying to make sure that they were able to get to the priests and keep the community on site for one side or the other in any given election. It's not it's not new. It's not specific to the Chinese government today. There are any number of states and governments that have played the role in the past. More often than not, it was local communities getting together and doing a little bit of arm twisting. And as I say, for having worked in politics in very multi-ethnic writings, nothing new in diaspora politics. What is new is the specific allegation of direct government involvement, money involvement in trying to choose candidates, in trying to determine who's going to run, in trying to help influence who gets elected in the hopes of having people in our democratic institutions that will have a favorable view of that country and its policies. 
That is new. That is something that has only been possible since the advent of social media types of things that we were just hearing at the commission now. And that's why we've got to learn that despite the fact that Canadian democracy has been doing well for over 150 years, we're not stronger than any other one. And we've got to figure out the techniques of doing it. If there was foreign government interference and they knew about it and they did nothing about it, that is indeed a political scandal. Yeah, sympathizers perhaps. We'll see. Uh, one last question. How worried are you, Tom, about the next election, uh, which we expect to happen next year? It's getting easier and not harder uh, to, to get to people and, and to influence. But I think that uh, what we've also seen, you know, the government had its ins with certain social media, um, most of the ones based in North America. But they seemed, again, to be most preoccupied with making sure that it didn't say bad things about the liberal leader. And they didn't do anything similar to, to try to protect other leaders of other parties. So I think that there is a pattern that we're starting to see here. It's taking a while for it to, to emerge. I actually have quite a bit of confidence in Madam Justice Hogue. She did something as this thing was just about to start. She reversed an earlier decision where she was going to exclude the, the, the lawyers from the Conservative Party from this. And she, she revised it. And it was very smart of her to do that because it showed that she was going to be playing with a far more neutral hand. Let's see what happens this afternoon when Trudeau gets on the stand. I think we're going to have some memorable moments. Tom Mulcair, CTV News political commentator, former leader of the NDP. Good to see you, Tom.